Hello and welcome to State View. I'm Mark Crosby of Quincy Access Television. Thank you for joining us for this show. State View looks at uh, what happens on Beacon Hill and how it affects you living uh, here throughout uh, Massachusetts. I say throughout Massachusetts because this program, though recorded in Quincy, does circulate throughout the Commonwealth. So we thank uh, the many access centers that uh, do run this program as well. Uh, joining me today from the second Norfolk district is Representative Tacky Chan. Representative, welcome back. Oh, thank you for having me back, Mark, and uh, good to be back in studio in some format, huh? It is. It's, it's great to have you back. You've been doing a lot of um, Zoom interviews, and uh, certainly uh, that has um, people have benefited from using Zoom and, and being able to interview in that uh, fashion, but it doesn't replace the uh, in studio. Uh, presence. Oh, absolutely, and most people don't realize that before the cameras even start rolling, you know, a chance to socialize and catch up of friends, families, and as we know, like watching Doctor Who conversations and other things. Absolutely. You know, it's a big part of our lives. Uh, you and I have shared those conversations, um, and I do appreciate I have a, a true uh, uh, fan uh, that I can um, discuss the program with, so it's actually doing quite well. I, the uh, the reboot of Doctor Who, I remember Doctor Who from the uh, the seventies, and then it had uh, it was briefly taken over as um, a British uh, American movie, mm -hmm. and then it uh, now is a series back uh, in its original uh, country, and that would be uh, England. Uh, but uh, let's. Uh, I, I'm already going off on a tangent. I do want to talk about first of all, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, thank you. It's a year of the tiger. Uh, I was the year of the ox. Actually, I'm born in the year of the ox. So I'm very half with a, happy that my year has not moved on. And uh, we hope that the tiger will be much more prosperous and healthy for everyone as we move forward. And just talk about uh, for folks that don't know the significance of Lunar New Year. Sure. Lunar New Year is the longest continuous running calendar. Out of the outside of the Jewish calendar in the world it is what it sounds like. It's based on the phases of the moon. Uh, it's well over 4,500 years old, if I can recall my calendars correctly. And it's based on a 12 year cycle. So every year is a different animal uh, of the cycle. And it goes back to a very simple story of uh, the emperor, God, uh, you can use whatever. Uh, Chinese religion reference for that part, but the Jade Emperor was preparing to uh, set a calendar and he uh, summoned the animals to a party to celebrate his uh, new uh, discovery. And uh, the calendar was picked based on what animal showed up and when they showed up. So the first year of the calendar is the year of the rat because the rat took a ride on the ox and jumped on off. So uh, instead of two animals getting the first year, uh, the rat wisely or cleverly became one, and the ox became second. So often I'm referred to as a beast of burden for rats. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Okay. And Lunar New Year is about, um, it's about luck and prosperity? Lunar New Year is about new times, you know, very much like a lot of other cultures. The New Year is a chance to start over, a chance to uh, get something new. It's a very big retail market for uh, uh, countries that actually celebrate Lunar New Year's, including in the United States. So a lot of Chinese, uh, Korean, Japanese, and other ones that follow the calendar. It's a very robust period. Um, also, uh, you also eat out a lot. And there's also a big chance for gathering families. It's the single most important holiday uh, in those cultures. And uh, obviously the COVID uh, situation has greatly inhibited international travel uh, to Asia, but also internal travel inside the countries themselves. Some uh, people inside their own countries haven't seen the family up to three years. Yeah, very, very difficult times. I know here in Quincy, uh, the celebration was virtual. Yes, again, the Quincy Asian Resources did a great job doing a fast pivot uh, from an in-person event. We actually were talking about that in December, early December before Omicron came full raging through, and uh, some very fast decisions had to be made uh, going to the two weeks prior. And, you know, thanks to QA TV and the internet people got at least 30 minutes of uh, Lunar New Year this year and uh, obviously they learned from last year how to do it a little bit better but hopefully uh, we'll return in a full person format the next year and have Kiwi TV come with us. Absolutely. Uh, here's hoping. Uh, let's talk about COVID-19 and uh, really the reopening of the State House. Sure, the State House reopened on uh, to the public on February 22nd. Prior to that Essential staff and legislators did have access to the building, 
Uh, but we also did follow uh, COVID protocols such as masks, social distancing, sanitation, and of course, contact tracing. Uh, to come visit the state house, you have to demonstrate a vac fully vaccination of two doses or a 24 hour negative COVID test prior. And uh, individual state house offices are now charged with contact tracing. So, for example, you come visit my office for any reason, we are asking people to provide some way to contact you if, God forbid, uh, one of us have COVID-19 or another guest that came through the office COVID-19, we may become asymptomatic carriers. So the state house is uh, still maintaining that COVID tracing component. I do understand the governor has stopped co uh, COVID tracing on a large scale, but uh, you know, it's, it still can be done at a small scale in people's offices and businesses. If you want a state house tour, that uh, is happening. Uh, oh, it is? It is, it, but it's by appointment. Um, I don't have the phone number right in front of me. Uh, but also the tour director uh, under the Secretary of State's office has discretion on the size of the tours, how many people uh, will be together to tour, and uh, obviously if things change, um, you know, they'll adjust accordingly. But in common areas of State House, we are requiring people to wear masks. You were in the studio uh, not too long ago uh, with the speaker, Speaker Ron Mariano, to talk about the Senior Circuit Breaker Tax Credit. So for those folks that might not have caught that program, uh, tell them how they could benefit. Sure, if you're over age 65 and you meet certain guidelines regarding income and property value, you can get a, a tax credit uh, from the Commonwealth up to about $1,170, I believe at this point, uh, for the taxes and a water bill that you pay. Uh, I'm sorry, the property taxes you pay if you own a home, uh, but if you're a renter, you get uh, up to, I believe, 25% of the rent and a portion of your water bill as well. So we encourage anyone that turns 65 in 2021, even as the last day of 2021, to definitely fill out the worksheet, which is Schedule CB, to see if you can qualify. And also, if you're over 65 now and you discover you didn't do this the three years prior, most definitely fill out prior year Schedule CB and amend it. If you don't pay taxes, uh, I do understand Social Security is not taxed in Massachusetts, and you, f you don't have not had to do a tax form, you definitely should also do this because it's a tax credit, not a tax deduction. I tell people deductions reduce your tax burden, credits is cash. So you can receive a check or direct deposit, uh, even if you pay no taxes, uh, provided you meet all the income uh, qualifications and uh, age requirement. I do want to... Um talk about there's so much to talk about uh, I, on the in the news most recently uh, governor charlie baker announced uh, basically it's a, um, a termination of contracts with russian companies uh, all this yeah. as a result of the ukraine crisis yes yeah, so for uh, do you actually date this show when you put it on? Because I think there's, I the, these, yeah, there's a degree of context in what's happening, right? If you're watching this two months later, obviously the context changes. So March 4th, everyone, this, this is being recorded on March 4th. Yeah, the governor uh, filed an executive order for the administration to review its contracts uh, that the state has and see which ones are uh, contracted with Russian companies based in Russia. I make that distinction very importantly because obviously we do contract with Russians who live in the United States. We're not targeting Russian individuals. We're looking at businesses that are based in Russia that we have contracts with. I don't know how many they are, but I suspect it might be not that many uh, that we do so. Uh, also know that in the news, people have been talking about uh, pouring out vodka uh, into the sink and not buying uh, Russian-made goods. I also remind folks that- Through store, uh, into storm drains as well, we should mention, yeah, which is a whole other issue. Which is environmentally problematic, especially for the MWRA's uh, or, uh, or bacterial organic based uh, digestion system for destroying our waste. So you can imagine pouring alcohol, but that could be a bit of a, a dilemma at the end of our array. Uh, but most importantly, retailers and wholesalers already bought those goods that are made from overseas. Uh, obviously, you can choose not to purchase those goods, but just keep in mind the one that gets hurt the most is the retailers and wholesalers because they can't return them back to Russia. Uh, it's already been bought. So I do admire folks that want to be supportive of Ukrainian. Uh, crisis uh, by uh, not uh, enriching uh, Russian foreign business. But please be mindful that you know, local business had already paid for those goods on those shelves. So we should mention that there are other ways to contribute for folks that do want to help Ukrainians. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, UNICEF, the, American, you know, the International Red Cross, you know, those organizations are, all, are right now you know, dealing with the humanitarian crisis as well as the UN, uh, directly intervening as well as the EU and the United States. I mean. Uh, 
President Biden has asked Congress for a very large package of spending to, to help the humanitarian crisis as well as providing more military support uh, for Ukraine through equipment and other essential supplies. People forget it's not just weapons, it's medicine, it's food, it's blankets. It, it, as you see in the news, I mean, you know, last night, uh, you know, a nuclear power plant uh, was attacked. Uh, it represents 25 percent of all power in Ukraine. Obviously, the, the Russians are attacking civilian infrastructure heavily as they try to basically starve, starve people into submission, for lack of a better term. And, uh, you know, it's now uh, under Russian control. So, you know, things like blankets and medicines are a big deal. And you've seen uh, footages on news as well regarding hospitals being attacked, pharmacies being emptied, and uh, reprioritization of uh, local goods towards the military. No different from any other wartime. And uh, we haven't experienced that here at that high level since World War II. So uh, I think, uh, you know, several generations of people now don't, don't realize exactly how, you know, personally devastating it is not uh, on just on uh, loss of lives, but also access to uh, goods that can help save lives. You and I were chatting about um, the way this is being covered now. Social media is playing a big part. Yes, uh, social media is, is definitely it. They obviously uh, destroyed a t uh, TV st uh, broadcast station in Kiev, uh, but people still are getting cell phone signals or satellite phones or any other type of uh, internet access and uh, still broadcasting on Facebook and Twitter and a number of other social media sites, things happening on the ground. Uh, I did watch DW News, which is a uh, broadcast out of Germany. They also remind folks to be very careful because people are using social media, sadly, to get more hits. And because social media uh, is monetized, some of it's monetized, uh, they may be recycling old footage of things that may or may not be real. So you know, we, there, there is a caution uh, from German news media saying, you know, yeah, you should watch it. We do care, but be mindful there's that element out there that people will try to, unfortunately, abuse. Um, yeah, but at the same time, though, you know, the, the mainstream media uh, you know, the 25 news cycle groups, as well as uh, local news and international media, is actually depending on um, social media to help identify where news sources is, because obviously they can't get there themselves. I should mention that uh, this interview has been, was rescheduled, I believe. I needed to move it, uh, but when I moved it, I then realized that you would be coming in during National Consumer Protection Week, which runs from March 6th uh, through the 12th, or you're right at the, you're mm -hmm. right at the beginning of, of um, the week. And why I mention that is because you're the chair of the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure. So uh, talk about that. Talk about protection in general and National Consumer Protection Week. Well, it's a week to bring greater awareness about consumer rights and ways to protect yourself regarding uh, potential fraud. So it actually is very timely because this time of year is the phone scam, email scam time of year regarding a very popular scam where the, uh, people claim to be from the IRS call you. and they, they Tax didn't. season. Tax season, and especially vulnerable on elders and people don't speak English as a first language. I've had more than one call on uh, my phone and my cell phone for people to speak Mandarin basically demanding I make money. I, uh, I'm sorry, give them money or the government's going to deport me. Uh, the, you know, the government does not call you to tell you you're going to be deported if you don't pay the government. But if you don't have good knowledge or you don't know who to call to ask you know, if this is a scam or not, you may fall for it. Unfortunately, as we joke about the Nigerian email, you know, wire me money, I'll give you 10 million back. You know, uh, we always joke about that, but people do actually fall for that. Uh, so uh, you know, part of uh, the week is to bring greater awareness to those things, know to contact the FTC, know to contact State Attorney General's office, and obviously I do encourage people to call my office as well. If you're not sure if something's legitimate or not, we're happy to track it down as well to see if it is legitimate or not. You know, websites like Snopes.com has been around, God, for, since the internet's inception, uh, also trying to identify uh, scams, as well as Consumer Business Reports and the Better Business Bureau and many other websites out there that have been uh, collecting data on, on fraudulent uh, uh, solicitations. So and on top of that, you still have your own consumer rights. For example, you know, truth in advertising, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the ability to know uh, what your ability to uh, collect a small claims cost under the state's Chapter 93 Consumer Protection Law. Um, you know, so there's other things beyond that. But tax, you know, conveniently, it's right in tax season. And uh, you know, just please be very mindful of uh, who contacts you uh, unsolicited. I know another uh, popular scam is um a scammer will call and tell someone on the other end of the line that we have, we are holding your grandson, your granddaughter, 
uh, something to that extent, and uh, we need money to release that um, relative. Yes, that actually is a scam that you've seen in Southeast Asia uh, quite a bit. Actually, there was an incident in Singapore regarding a, a Chinese student where that scam was actually uh, implemented and they try to wire money out of their uh, parents in China. Uh, so this is actually uh, becoming uh, very popular to do that. The other one uh, is popular is the whole, your computer's been locked out. And uh, your computer has not been locked out. Uh, but they want to be able to have access to your computer so you can steal your uh, passwords and other sensitive, do sensitive documents uh, over the internet by making you download one of those uh, mirror systems, syncing systems onto your computer so you can access the computer and rip stuff out. So, you know, if you, uh, you know, get a phone call or tech support, uh, don't, don't give them anything. Just, just hang up. But, yeah, the other scam is actually real. It does happen actually quite a bit in Southeast Asia. Interesting. Uh, the, since the last time we spoke, uh, we were going to talk, we knew the next program we were going to talk about the joint rule number 10. It's basically the current status of uh, legislation, correct? Sure. It's a little procedural. We've got a little procedural... Uh, uh, geeking out, I suppose. Uh, I spend a lot of time on procedural issues. So under the uh, rules of the House and Senate, uh, we have a thing called Joint Rule 10. Joint Rule 10 is when all bills are finally timed, uh, pr uh, which is anything 30 days prior to Joint Rule 10 due date. So Joint Rule 10 was February 2nd, so minus 30 days. Those bills have to be given a action by committees, the Joint Committees, on whether they get a favorable, unfavorable study order no action, which is kind of a weird procedural issue uh, because that, that means they automatically go out not to pass uh, onto the clerk. Or the, those no action issues are put in a study order of which both House and the Senate has to approve, I'm sorry, not study, extension order. The House has to approve an extension for no action bills to a date certain. So, you know, we have about 4,400 bills that are timely filed. Uh, we have a thing called late file bills, which are bills that are filed after the original deadline, which is in the 3rd January a third Friday in January of the first half of the two-year cycle, which is this year, the third Friday in January 2021. And then anything filed that's considered a late file bill. Uh, but um, at the end, though, uh, we dispense with probably close to 90, 95 percent of all bills getting some kind of action. Uh, and, you know, I, even as a chair, I have uh, certain topic matters I've, I've put in extension order, including things like the resale of tickets, um, a horse and dog racing, uh, uh, reform bill. It's a really complicated issue. We just call it reform bill for, s for the sake of ease. And uh, we have some other alcohol related bills that are uh, associated with outdoor dining that we put in extension order. And uh, so we, you know, it's, t it's not always by the volume of bills, it's the topic. Okay. As I like to put it. So we really clump all bills of a similar type and put them in extension order. So you may have 50 bills in extension order, but may only address one issue. So I tell people, don't get caught up with the numbers. It's really the subject matter that, that's most important. What's some, uh, an update on some of the legislation in your committee that you could talk about? Sure, we released some uh, very interesting bills that get almost no news coverage, I promise you. Except here. <laughs> this is the only place you're going to hear about them. So uh, we uh, do an update regarding the consumer protections on gym memberships. As people remember, the Boston Sports Club was still charging you uh, during the pandemic. And uh, we also discovered they also charge people, for example, if you suffer a uh, debilitating de 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 situation physically, uh, you should be able to get out of your gym membership. Sure. So we uh, put in some very reasonable things such as that, that allows you to get out of your gym membership, better notification about your rights, uh, the, uh, give you a, a longer time period for a trial, uh, I believe we put down 10 days, and other uh, what we think common sense things, I think many people are watching can figure what common sense things that you can cancel your gym membership on. Um, obviously, the Attorney General got a, a, a good sized settlement out of the Boston Sports Club to try to recoup uh, some folks that uh, were unjustly charged uh, during, the, uh, during the shutdown during COVID. Um, other stuff we put out, we put a wheelchair warranty update. Um, another fascinating issue where we discovered that the consolidation of businesses as a result of a very small number of national uh, companies actually own your wheelchairs, own and sell wheelchairs and repair wheelchairs. So we're doing an update to reflect the fact there's been a massive consolidation of the industry. Because there used to be, you know, five to ten uh, wheelchair uh, repair and resellers within New England. They're really down to two. 
So these are things we kind of discover. We uh, worked out a fair housing piece regarding full disclosure of broker's fees prior to, you know, in, in terms of being a renter. Uh, there's been some issues about um, uh, these extra fees that aren't first month, last month, last month and the security deposit. Um, we uh, created a commission to look at a new form of redlining. You know, those who know why I say redlining is, is basically, um, at the time, banks would actually dictate where people of different ethnicities are allowed to live by uh, gearing loans. Now, uh, there's been anecdotal and some uh, small studies done. So it's not anecdotal with the study. So there's at least one study done about that happening in the renter's market. And uh, we think that's warranted to actually have further investigation by the Executive Office of Housing and, uh, Housing and Urban Development. So we charge them to look at those issues. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple of small ones. Other things like changing the veterinarian board's license dates to coincide on the calendar year, as supposed to birthdays. Uh, not exciting, Bill. Uh, we have the genetic counselors uh, that is a licensed profession that has educational updates. Again, not that exciting, folks. Uh, but these are actually very important to professions that need to have their state law uh, keep up with their professions. Lottery news, any news on the Massachusetts State Lottery? Because that also comes under your committee. Yeah, we didn't do any changes to the State Lottery this year. I know there's been a push for online lottery quite a bit. Right. Uh, but I remind folks, we're still a top five lottery in the United States in terms of total sales. Uh, we've had uh, record-breaking numbers in 2021. I think we're not quite done yet. Uh, during the COVID shutdown, uh, we took not necessarily just a hit on people buying their tickets at the uh, retail, but also Kino. 10% of all uh, lottery sales came out of Kino. So once the restaurants were reopening at some capacity, uh, whether it be uh, indoor, outdoor dining, uh, those Kino numbers rocketed back in uh, very rapidly. So, you know, given the fact that uh, uh, they've had record growth every single year and withstood COVID uh, shutdown, we, we don't see any need to do major changes to the lottery at this time. You were in the uh, city of Quincy not too long ago uh, when the MBTA bus maintenance facility uh, groundbreaking uh, took place. And that, uh, talk a little bit about that in the sense that that is using funding from the bipartisan infrastructure plan. Yes, the, uh, the desire to have cleaner buses is part of the motor raising reason for having this new garage. It's not the sole reason. Uh, those who know where the garage is, is on Hancock Street uh, after Veterans Memorial Stadium going southbound. It's been there, I've been told, well into 100 years, I think. So people keep telling me, because uh, I'm not old enough to remember when it opened. Uh, but Neither am I. Yeah, but it's always been there. Uh, it's actually near a wetland area. Obviously, this was built beyond modern environmental uh, construction laws. And uh, it doesn't fit modern sized buses, which is why you still see those diesel buses so long in Quincy. So a new facility would definitely allow uh, the modern uh, hybrid buses and down the road full electric buses. So this is, and its geographic location also makes it a little better to get in and out. Those who've actually been out Hancock Street trying to watch a bus back in, pull out, you know, try to work around and so on, park illegally on the wrong side of the road. You guys who drive down Hancock Street know exactly what I'm talking about. Please don't park in places, don't park. It makes buses have all kinds of challenges. And it just slows the rest of us up in traffic. It just upsets everybody on the street, right? Uh, but this actually will give better egress points uh, for a system hub that services Quincy, Mattapan, Randolph, Weymouth, Braintree. It's actually a very good location for that. I'm glad you said that because my next question was, uh, well, not so much a question, it was um, an observation that this isn't just for Quincy, but the surrounding communities as well. Yes, Quincy is a hub of the MBTA uh, south of Boston. Uh, obviously, Quincy Southern Rail Line Station, the commuter rail is there. Uh, we hub uh, all the traffic through on the bus through the Quincy Center area. So, uh, you know, this is crucial, uh, not just for Quincy, but on a regional level. And as I said, as uh, hybrid and electric buses come online, it's going to be great environmentally as well. Well, this is, uh, that's just the, uh, just, just the thing. To hear that electric buses are uh, in the plan is, is a big boost, I think, for um, for those, uh, well, we should all be environmentally conscious. Let's let's face it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I remember uh, when I worked for uh, then Senator Morrissey, they had unrolled the first set of uh, liquid gas buses, uh, uh, get off petrol onto uh, natural gas buses, which 25 years ago was like actually a very big deal, folks. I mean, uh, because uh, hybrid buses were not even a possibility yet. 
but Quincy couldn't get any largely because of the garage. People forget those things about the fact that Quincy uh, bus tech wasn't able to get the best new technology buses when they came out strictly because of that garage. In the last uh, couple minutes of, of this program, I'm going to uh, open it wide open and, and ask you if there's something that you would like to address that we haven't addressed as of yet. Yeah, you know that's always dangerous. You're no. saying that over and I'm, over I'm again. ready. <laughs> They're ready. <laughs> well, I simply would just remind folks uh, again, we're uh, obviously moving into a safer period in the COVID Omicron era. But what troubles me all the time is through the death counts. Uh, when I'm still seeing 61, 50, 25, you know, even if it's a long weekend on a Monday, when they only report the numbers on, on that, it's a still a stock, stock and, and a sobering reminder uh, that, uh, that it's still here. And uh, I, I tell folks that, uh, you know, that uh, it's, it's not gone yet. And you mentioned uh, the outdoor dining extension. Is that what um, you had addressed as well in your committee? Yeah, this is a little bit of a confusing issue for folks. The messaging is a problem. The outdoor dining extension only is about, only is about allowing cities and towns to be able to not obey any laws and regulations to implement outdoor dining. It does not mean outdoor dining ends. So what we discovered in, through the committee is a lot of communities have, have been moving to implement the current laws and regulations in safety, access, and other things on outdoor dining. So the myth out there, and you all looking at me like, what are you talking about? You had outdoor dining before we had this thing, this, 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 this deadline. So uh, we, we, the extension only allows the non usage of laws and regulations to implement outdoor dining. That's okay. all it is. Okay. It, we be, basically suspend the rules so local government can just do whatever they feel like. But like I said, in conversations with different folks in the industries, uh, both the restaurants and retail and with the municipalities, they have all been moving towards um, compliance anyway. Because they all discovered you know, ADA, fire, capacity, you know, all that stuff, uh, you know, alcohol, uh, is something that we're also working on to expedite uh, reviews for continuous uh, use, meaning that your uh, outdoor dining is part of a continuing use of your indoor dining uh, and uh, also expedited review process. I would still believe that everybody should have a say in the matter. You know, what the governor did and what we did was also uh, create a situation where uh, licensing boards uh, would not need to listen to you about whether or not you think this is a good idea. So that's another thing that we did through outdoor dining is we actually s didn't create a due process for that. And, I had argued this with uh, the speaker and the chair ways and means about my desire to maintain due process. But given the uh, emergency circumstances, um, you know, the, the judgment was that we, we got to give as much flexibility to address the COVID economic um, situation. Absolutely. I want to thank you for joining me here today and uh, informing the folks uh, throughout the Commonwealth about um, your work at the State House. Well, thank you for having me, and we'll be back again soon like to hear that hopefully in person again thank you at home for watching please continue to support your local access TV station for programming just like this